Thank you, Ms. Gutt, for your kind introduction. And I'd like to thank Professor Dev and Professor Dattagupta to initiate this school and to make it uh, possible. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, difficult to you know, hold this meeting. And uh, today, uh, I am going to talk the structure beam propagation through the atomic medium. Basically, uh, when beam propagate, it uh, different due to the geometrical uh, effect of the beam. Now, when it, even if the beam propagates through the free space, depending upon the angle of divergence, beam will deflect. Now, the first question is that how one can control this deflection with the help of the atomic medium. And second, what would be the beam propagation equation when electromagnetic radiation propagate through the atomic vapor. Third question would be the, how you manipulate the dispersion, diffraction, and absorption terms of the medium so that your beam can propagate through the medium without any attenuation. So there are a lot of challenge. We have to fulfill the, those uh, criteria and make the beam propagate through the medium. So let us uh, start from the very basic equation. That is the Maxwell Ford equation. First equation, uh, you can see del dot d is equal to zero. Basically, it, uh, here I am very sorry to use the CGS unit. So, so most of you are very accustomed to handle with this SI unit, but uh, you please uh, take care of this unit conversion. So first term, del dot d, which is a Gaussian Gauss law. So if you have a charge, then it is a inhomogeneous equation. Now the second equation is a Gilbert law, del dot b is equal to zero. And you have a, this Faraday's law, del cross c is equal to minus one by c del del t of b. And the final one is the is del cross a is in presence of the current, you can write 4 pi by c plus 1 by c del d del t. So since we are dealing first the free space, so we can make this uh, charge and current is zero. Then from the material equation, as you know, the d, the electric displacement current can be related to the induced polarization. So E plus four pi P, and then B, that is the magnetic field induction can be related with the magnetic field H plus four pi M. So M is the magnetization and P is the polarization. If you have a medium which, ha which can show the magnetic susceptibility and the electric susceptibility in free space, these two are absent. So therefore, you can consider D is equal to E and B is equal to H. So <clears throat> under this condition, we already know from Professor Dev's uh, lecture that uh, one can express the electric and magnetic field vector in terms of the scalar and vector potential. So here we are we introducing the scalar and vector potential once again. And then you can see E is equal to minus grad phi minus del A del T and B is equal to curl of A. And if you follow this uh, Faraday's law, del cross C is equal to one by C del B del T. And if you take a curl of this, then what you will get curl of this equation that is x, y, and z. And together with, you have a, the exponential terms e to the power i k z minus i omega t. Here you remember that we are working with the beam and it is a quasi monochromatic. So therefore, we are neglecting the 
frequency spread around the center frequency of the beam. So now, if I put this vector potential expression in my equation to find out what is the magnetic field, and we are going to see what is the behavior of the magnetic field in presence of when the vector field has a transverse dependent with the, with the space. Now, you can see that curl of A, you can have this expression. So here, you, you and then you have a derivative of the envelope along the z direction. Then also you have a, another derivative of the envelope with respect to y. Now we are going to do the paraxial wave approximation. That means the variation of the envelope along the z direction is negligibly small compared to the variation of envelope along the x and y direction. And with this, also you can see you have a exponential terms e to the power i k z. So this also vary with one optical wavelength. So the field is not going to vary too much or is it can vary very little within the one optical wavelength. With this approximation, you can see that if I multiply k into u, and if I compare the second term with k into u del u del z, and we consider k into u is very, very greater than del u by del z. So with this approximation, I can safely neglect this term. So therefore, what you have? You have a u and the variation along the transverse direction. So this is the my, my magnetic field value. Now we can get the electric field. How do I get electric field? If I know the magnetic field, hmm? anybody? Carl of H, right, is going to give you 1 by C del del T of D. So now, so let me show you the, what is the paraxial wave approximation. Here the divergence angle, you have to be very uh, careful about the theta. If the theta is less than 0.5 radian or less than the 30 degree, you can do simply the paraxial wave approximation. All collimated laser can have this approximation. But when you have a tightly focused beam, that cannot be satisfied by this paraxial wave approximation and you have to do non-paraxial right, beam propagation equation when you have a very tightly focused beam. And you can see that, you know, I have ploy, uh, depicted the phase diagram and you have a, also the envelope and at it, if it moves from j is equal to zero to some other length, it will diffract. So anybody knows what is the reason of the diffraction? It is a geometrical origin because at line center, the with this minimum, then it is going to diffract. So what is the physical interpretation? Physical interpretation is that the beam can be composed of many plane waves. And when this plane wave will propagate through the free space, not even in the medium, it will gather different, different phase. And in one plane, that different phase is going to do the interference. And because of this phase is different from each other, it will broaden the shape of the envelope. That is the story of the diffraction. So some of the beam, like a Matthew beam, Bessel beam, they are going to gather the unique phase. All component should gather a unique phase. Then this beam is not going to diffract. Even it propagate a th through the length of free space of 20, my, uh, 20 Rayleigh length. So this is the reason. So if you adjust the phase gathered by the different component in such a way that 
this will compensate with the medium phase, then you can propagate the beam through the medium without any diffraction. That is the engineering part of the atomic medium. We are going to discuss that. Now, so to calculate this uh, electric field, we are going to take help of, from the Ampere's law in the absence of the current. And you can see there are a lot of calculation, right? So now under this uh, paroxysmal wave approximation, what is that? K times U is very, very greater than K square del U del Z is very, very greater than del square U del Z square. So then you are going to have electric field that is the E is equal to I times K X cap U plus I by K del U del X of Z and then you have a the phase part. You can see initially if you do the dot product E dot B, it is not perpendicular to each other, is it? Right? If I neglect the axial variation, right, then it is, but this is the real field. It is coming from the transverse electromagnetic right, field from the laser cavity. So now, once I know the electric field and magnetic field, then I can calculate what is my pointing vector that is already introduced, Professor Dev. So let me carry that expression. So what we are going to do, we are going to calculate the time average pointing vector. Because you know, your electric field has a e to the power i omega t. I have gave one problem on based on this cycl cyclic average. If you see my class note, right, I have given 11 problem, okay. So that problem, some of the problem is based on the Maxwell equation. There are five problem. And then sixth problem is based on the density matrix equation. And if you do this, if you solve this uh, density matrix equation, as well as the Maxwell wave equation, so you will know, get to know how one can manipulate the medium property with help of the radiation. So now, let us see time average pointing vector. And this, this time average pointing vector we have defined as a C by 4 phi, so it is in the CGS unit, E cross P, right? So now if I write in the, since electric field and magnetic field, in the definition we consider as a complex zone, then I have to introduce the complex conjugate, and in that E star cross B plus E cross B star is going to give you the pointing vector. So now, if you consider this, uh, this axial variation, then the pointing vector has uh, this term, and this term gives you the angular momentum, and also the radial component. And this term is going to carry by the linear momentum. And if you consider the Gau this logarithmic Gaussian beam, which has a shape like, you know, U, R, Z, e to the power I, L phi. So depending upon the L, it carries the angular momentum, right? In this form, you can calculate, right? So what is the uh, angular momentum or the, or the pointing vector along the phi direction? What is the pointing vector along the radial direction? And what would be the pointing vector along the Z direction? So you have to just follow the treatment here and you will get this three non-zero value. And now, if I depict all those non-zero value, then you can see you have a helix is rotating. And you can see along the jet direction, it carries the linear momentum. And you have a radial direction component and that gives you the diffraction. Now you have a, the component which has a, along the phi direction, it carries the angular momentum along the z direction. So now, so this beam can carry the angular momentum, also carries the linear momentum and spread also. 
So there are two ways a beam can rotate. One is the spin angular momentum, already you know. So when you have a, when you consider a photon, this photon has a two spin, either positive helicity or, or negative helicity. And similarly, if you have a cylindrical symmetry, if the L is non-zero, then it will show you the wave front, how the helix can move forward along the jet direction and it carries the momentum. So when L is equal to one, it has a one helix. If L is equal to two, you can have a two helix. Now, let us see. Now let us uh, go back to my wave equation. So when you see the wave equation is the second order partial derivative on space, right? And second order time derivative. And we are going to consider the field envelope like the polarization and this is a, a field envelope E0, X, Y, Z, then you have a e to the power minus omega t, i omega t plus k z. Now if I substitute this expression, this is the, my plane wave solution and I am going to su substitute in this Maxwell wave equation in free space, then I can see there are six term and you can see when it is in free space, you, we know that a is equal to omega by c, right? Now, if there is a medium, how it relates? The k vector, k is equal to n omega, omega by c. So when n omega is equal to one for free space, right? So this one's in free medium, then you can see k is equal to omega by c. And if I substitute here, these two terms cancel it out. Then what do you have? You have a second order in the transverse component, these two, and you have a two terms comes from the longitudinal variation. What are those? One is del del z on epsilon zero, and another del square z, del square epsilon zero, del z square. Now, here we are going to do the paraxial wave approximation, and we are going to neglect the second order derivative. So if I neglect the second order derivative, this green term, then ultimately I am going to end up with this paraxial wave approximation, paraxial wave equation for the field in free space. Fine. And now you can consider epsilon zero safe, envelope safe. It may be a Gaussian. It gives you a solution. It may be a logarithmic Gaussian we are going to solve in detail for the logarithmic Gaussian because this detailed calculation you should know because it is a little bit uh, cumbersome and it has a lot of physics. So now what I am going to do, I am going to write this uh, Laplacian operator in terms of the cylindrical coordinate system. So what I have in the cylindrical coordinate system R, phi, and z. So z is the longitudinal coordinate system and R and phi is going to give you the, the transverse plane. Now, if I substitute, right, this R phi dependent and we are going to assume the structure of the field. Here is the important things. So here, you are not going to get the solution from the equation. You are going to assume some structure and get whether this structure is going to match with the wave equation or not, that we are going to find. So here we are going to consider the structure of the field is a um, R dependent and R is going to change by this variable zeta. Zeta is equal to two R square by omega Z square that is the beam width at a distance z. So you can write, later we can find it out what is the relation with omega z with omega zero at the initial beam west. 
Now, what do we have? We have a phase vector. So we need to find it, find it out Pz, Q, Qz, the Q will be here, here, and we need to find it out the, what is the L, that is the logarithm polynomial. Now, if I substitute this envelope in this uh, equation, after a lengthy calculation, you will get this expression. And this expression contains the second order derivative as well as the first order derivative. Similarly, if you do the derivative with respect to z on this envelope, you will get uh, this expression. So now, first, what we are going to do, first we are going to do, neglect the derivative with respect to zeta and deri double derivative with respect to zeta square that we are going to neglect and see the order of zeta in the left hand side with a right hand side. And you can see this, the, please focus on this part, m1, which we define as m1 is equal to k w square by 4, 4q. So now, if I compare the first order of the zeta with these two equation, then I should have one equivalent that is del q by del z, right? If del q by del z is not equal to one, then this, these are not equivalent. But this del q by del z is going to give you the very famous approximation. Anybody knows what is that? Del Q by del Z. Hmm? So del Q by del Z is, is comes from the paraxial Helmholtz equation. So the beam cannot diverge at infinity. So at infinity, it should converge. So del Q by del Z is going to give you the guarantee that beam should have a finite value when Z turns to infinity. So now, I have written just analogous to the Gaussian beam, I have written 1 by Qz, and you can do very explicitly that Qz can be expressed as a 1 by Rz plus 2i by k omega square. And if you put this condition, then you will get a Rz is equal to z square plus z naught square by z. So when z is equal to 0, Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can see when z is equal to z zero, right? The value, what is the value of r r zero? Hmm? What is the value? Right? From there, right? Now. From this expression, you will get this uh, omega z is equal to root over 1 plus z square by z naught square. What is the z naught? z naught is the Rayleigh length. So now, if I put this value, provided, yeah, provided you have a one derivative, del omega, del zeta by omega, and from this relation, this uh, omega prime by omega, you will get a 1 by r. So we have substituted this 1 by r. Now we can do the separation of variable, right? You can see the left hand side, it is only related with the L, right hand side, the other coefficient. So we can write this zeta del squared L del zeta square plus 1 plus L minus zeta is equal to some constant into L. So here we are going to do this separation of variable. Now you can see the rest of the equation also it will give you minus PL. So from this, from the, the second, this expression, you will get a result of the structure of the phase e to the power i p z. If you solve it, you will get a omega 0 by omega z e to the power i 1 plus l plus 2p. Let me, <coughs> let me tell you what is the l. 
L is the orbital quantum number and P is the radial quantum number and it is associated with the tan inverse is multiplied with this tan inverse z by z dot. Now this equation is going to give you the logarithm differential equation. So now you can, uh, you can know what is the form of the logarithm function, what is the order. So if you consider the p is equal to 0, you will get a 1 and then if you consider p is equal to 1, this is the structure and it is well known in mathematics. So therefore, you can see the envelope of the logarithmic Gaussian beam is associated with the beam width at z, uh, z is equal to not equal to 0 and it is also related with the omega 0. Then you have a radial dependent part, you have a logarithm function and you have a overall the phase structure here. Let us see the other uh, phase structure and the phase from VBR of this logarithm Gaussian. So you can see that when z is equal to 0, you have a minimum waste of omega z is equal to omega 0. And we know that Rayleigh wavelength that is k omega 0 square by 2. And the radius of curvature that is rz is going to vary with a z square plus z naught square by z. Sorry, there is a typo. So it should be z naught or z whatever you like. So now the, you have a goi phase that is the phi z is equal to an inverse z by z r and you will multiply it 2p plus l plus m. Sorry, it should be l. So now let us depict in the uh, diagram this variation. At z is equal to 0, you can see it is focused, right? The Gaussian beam at z is equal to some other length, it, you can see it is spread along the, along the transverse direction. And you can see that angle of divergence, if you just draw one uh, uh, straight line by touching this here, then you can see the theta and the theta should be very much less than this or theta is less than 30 degree. So at this value, this paraxial approximation hold good. Now the question is, how do you protect the beam, right? Beam, general tendency is to diffract as this propagate. So if I want to protect my size, so it should not be gather any phase, fine, that we will discuss. So now let us see the intensity profile, this is the intensity profile, then the, we have plotted the phase profile and this is the wave front. When I consider L is equal to 0, because L is a non-negative uh, number, so if I consider this L is equal to 0, it concerns one helicoid and sorry, uh, so when L is equal to 0, you have a, the phase front is a plane and then this is the uniform phase distribution and when you have a L is equal to 1, you can see you have a one helix and here is a certain jump in phase. But here you can see that uh, since we know that logarithm Gaussian has a shape of the donut shape. So at the line centered, your intensity is zero. So phase is not defined there. So they are, therefore you have a singularity. So now when you increase the L is equal to two, the dark area of the donut shape is going to increase and you have a two phase discontinuity. So this is our um, phase diagram. Now the question is that always people always think about the high intense, intense light. If the intensity is low, then what is the, is there any other way, any, any way to map the phase information to the intensity information? 
and this is true. One can do the experiment in the atomic vapor where two field is very weak and these two field has a phase structure that can be mapped to the atomic uh, response function and later on this atomic response function is going to map to the beam. So therefore the phase information can be converted to the intensity information and that is done by this uh, Sonja et al in the PRL paper. They have beautifully, beautifully demonstrated that even in the weak probe field that phase information can we manipulate and get a proper transparency and beam will propagate through the medium and one can also get the uh, discrete uh, transparency to the continuous transparency. So we are going to show next that vector beam. What is the vector beam? So far we, have cons we did not consider the polarization vector. Now we are going to consider the polarization vector and you have a the beam is defined with a left circularly polarized light and right circularly polarized light. And this is your um, logarithmic Gaussian beam, which is a different weightage factor. What we have? Cos alpha and logarithmic Gaussian uh, function with a zero radial mode, with a non zero orbital mode. And similarly, it is a sine alpha. Now, depending upon the value of alpha, and yeah. So the singularity lies at the center. No, I agree. Here, here, here is the discontinuity. No, it is you are saying that you are plotting it like the space in x and y axis. x and y axis, then the phi. Yeah. Okay, and then you, you are trying to see that No, phi, I am going to let us say, consider this because it is a uniform phase. Okay. Now, when you have a L is equal to 1, right? So you have a, if you rotate the phase, 0 to 2 pi, right? It has a jump, 0 to 2 pi value. That's this, here is the discontinuity, right? Similarly, when L is equal to 2, you have a 2 jump, okay? Well, yeah, phase, but not a discontinuity. Discontinuity lies at the, the optical axis, while your intensity is 0, okay? Sorry, uh, not a discontinuity, singularity. Because when you rotate one angle, so it is going to gather a 2 pi phase. That is the angular momentum. Angular momentum. Yeah, yeah. And for n equal to 2, yeah. yeah, 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 that relation. So now here we are going to discuss about the, the Gaussian beam, which has a polarization, uniform polarization throughout the xy axis. But when you consider the Lehman vector beam, like when you consider alpha is equal to pi 4, pi by 4, you are going to have a, the polarization or the state of the polarization at a different, different point is different. You can see that here the polarization ellipse is different, here is a more elliptical and then here is the straight line making angle phi. So polarization is here inhomogeneous. So it is a vector beam. So in order to get the, and this is also called as a point curve beam because if you draw a optics axis passing through the center, you can see there is a no symmetry. But if you have a symmetry around the optics axis, then it is called a cylindrical vector beam. I will show you next. Here you can see that uh, when you have a optics axis at, at this point, it is a symmetry around the optics axis. So this, this one is a radial polarized cylindrical beam and this one is the azimuthal and this one by changing the value of theta at a different, different value, theta is equal to 0, pi and pi by 2 minus pi by 2, you are going to get a this spiral nature. So now this one is a vector beam point curve vector beam. So when I consider alpha is equal to pi by 4, right, L is equal to 1, then if I consider L is equal to minus 1, 
then this nature and this is the wave nature. So now we are going to include the medium because whatever we have done earlier it is in the free space right. So free space we do not have any control on the radiation but in the medium we can change the medium property in such a way that we can we can control the the beam through the through the medium. So there what we are going to do you know we are again going to consider the Maxwell lubrication in presence of the polarization. So now you can see you have a polar induced polarization. So what is happening when the field is moving through the atomic medium it is going to disturb the medium. When medium is going to disturb then it is this medium property is going to change the incident radiation. So it is a self consistent manner you have to solve. So I basically I am going to change your profile and after changing your profile you are going to affect my profile. So, so this process will do continuously. So you have to solve this the this inhomogeneous second order differential equation. Now what we are going to do we define the electric field in this fashion. Now similarly we are going to define the polarization. Since the polarization induced because of the incident field. So nature of the structure of the polarization is same as in the electric field. Now what we are going to do we are going to put this expression in the Maxwell wave equation and then we are going to use the paraxial wave approximation ultimately you can see you have a paraxial wave approximation but with a source term. Now you have to study this equation. So linear, non-linear anything. If the no, no, if you consider the non-linear medium then the, the term over here would be different power like a 2 pi here. Yeah. This is this one is the linear ok. But this valid the treatment is valid for non-linear medium also but you have to include the term over here ok. So now you can see that this uh, Maxwell equation if I just neglect the transverse part what do you have 2 pi i they are linked they are linked, they are linked. So they are linked. but if I show you show you the, the, the graphs from there you can get the link like if you have a absorption graph I am going to show that will give you if you take a derivative you will get this ok. So now here we are what we are going to do we are going to consider a very simple system that is the two level atomic system it is a very simple system and it involves only the two energy level and we apply the probe field and probe field frequency in such a way that it is going to couple one of the transition you have a many transition but the incident frequency is going to decide which coupling the, it is going to do not only the frequency but also its polarization right. If it is a dipole allowed you can get a transition if it is not dipole allowed you have to think how to how to couple this to transition right. So now we considered this Robida atomic vapor and the, you can see it has a field cell of KR and then last electron stay at the 5s cell and if you if you uh, impinge the probe field with a frequency of let us say 780 nanometer or 795 then you can couple one of the state right. Let us consider this is the ground state means where the lifetime is very large and you have a the excited state. Here we have done lot of uh, um, what is called a lot of calculation it is there in my lecture you have to do the dipole moment approximation right. 
So under the dipole moment approximation, you can see the interaction Hamiltonian can be written as a d dot t. So basically, you can see if you have a d dot t, So now, what do we know? We know this projection operator is unity, right? Now, if I apply this projection operator, And can you see how many terms we are going to have? You are going to have a four terms, right? So you have a D11, that is one D1 and D12, one D2 and vice versa, right? What is the meaning of D11? Sorry, ah, sorry, thank you. Right? So now you tell me what is that uh, D11? Anybody? D11 is the permanent dipole moment. D13 is the induced dipole moment, inducing by the incident field electromagnetic radiation. Right? Like a polar molecule will have a permanent dipole moment. Fine? So now, if I consider the atomic medium, like a rubidium, you can just say 0 for D11 and D33. So what is the non-zero part? That is the D13 and D31, right? So if I, if I construct the Hamiltonian after, because you know uh, there is a oscillating, highly oscillating term, and that oscillating terms should be removed by unitary transformation. So we are going to move from one reference frame to another reference frame to get this effective Hamiltonian where explicit time is not present. Now you can see the Hamiltonian which is a h cross delta p is 3, 3 minus h cut g, g known as a Rabi frequency. So Rabi frequency means at which frequency atom oscillate from ground state to excited state, again the, it will come down to the excited state ground state. That frequency is called the Rabi frequency and it is defined as a D dipole moment dot incident electric field by H cut. And you have also the e to the power I k dot R since we are working in the dipole moment approximation. So this e to the power I k dot R you can simply write as a 1. So now you can form the uh, dynamical equation by use of this Lively density matrix equation rho dot is equal to minus i by h cut h effective and rho this is commutation and then the, this is the decay terms, right? So how do you uh, calculate the decay terms? Anybody has the idea? these decay terms. Hmm? Have you heard about the reserve theory? Markov, Markov approximation? No. Then I uh, will supply another note where one can do the Markov approximation to get the decoherence rate. Right? What are the decoherence rate? Let me tell you first. So basically what you have, you have alpha, right? You are looking for this dynamics of this state. So this state can decay to some other channel. It can decay 
like you have a beta 1, right, beta 2, and beta 3. So this represents the decay of the alpha state. Now, what is this? This represents how many ways this alpha state is going to populate. So you can write a different indices, right, beta prime. So you may have beta 1 prime, right, to here, right. So this is going to give you the dynamics of, dy dynamics of the excited state population. Similarly, you can find it out, the dynamics of the coherence, coherence means the superposition state, like a, this thing, what you have, d, dt of alpha beta, right, that will give So this is the decoherence rate of the coherence, atomic coherence, yeah. So I think you are trying to teach this issue or something mm -hmm. in semi-classical description yeah. where you are treating atomic parts to limb by dissociation. yes. So and that will um, picture everything in quantum, quantum mechanics. mechanics. And you will use, use the classical wave equation, right, Maxwell equation to treat the radiation part, okay. Yeah. Beta prime and beta should be extreme. Um, yeah, sure. You are right. This should be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now you can see that I have a row 3, 3, which can be decay to the row uh, 1. So it has a spontaneous decay rate of minus 2 gamma row 3, 3. Similarly, row 1, 1 dot is going to get again from the row 3, 3. That's why you have a 2 gamma row 3, 3, right? And if you add together, you can see that row 1, 1 plus row 2, 2 or, or row 3, 3 is equal to 0. So population is conserved. Now, if you see the coherence part, row 3, 1, right? So with a perturbation analysis, what you can do, you can consider your field is weak, so you can expand that uh, density matrix row in terms of the weak probe field. So this is the first order weak probe field, and this is the conjugate, and this is the zero order. So what does it mean? Mean when the field is not there, atom should be in the ground state. So all atoms should be in the your three state. Where is that? Yeah, this state, row 1, 1 at time t is equal to 0 is there, right? So in absence of this field, row 1, 1, 0 is equal to 1. Now, once I have this information, that initial information, I can plug here and get my atomic coherence at later time, at steady state limit, because here we are going to make the time derivative equal to 0. Yeah. I have a question here. Mm. When this description will fail for light, then you are still assuming weak. Weak. Right? Yeah, yeah. So when quantum mechanics are going to Yeah, this uh, we have a rotating wave approximation. The uh, This will fail when the control, uh, this uh, Rabi frequency is equivalent to the, that uh, field frequency. That is the, what is that? Omega p. Right? Here the, the Rabi frequency of the order of? That you can say weak field but yeah. strong interaction. Strong right? interaction. Okay. But you can also go for this, uh, this Rabi frequency which is a gigahertz range. Also the carrier frequency is gigahertz range. But in that case, you have to do the non-rotating wave approximation. So I don't think non-rotating is only required. Hmm? I'm just trying to say that like what I yeah. have. Yeah. So uh, I will treat even light as this quantum mechanism. Okay, right? okay. So and I'm trying to understand uh, this theory will break down. Like, 
intensity. Now, when you the intensity is very high. No, I don't uh, need intensity. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Now, fully quantum approach, you have to quantize that yeah. field. Yeah. You are doing because you are not taking. No, 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 no. You are doing standard. Yeah, semi classical approach. You are putting damping rate. Yeah, damping rate. Yeah. Talk about the Bavarian, but you are not discussing about the Bavarian. No, 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 no. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, yeah, quantum to classical, yeah. So let's say we talk about single photon interaction, mm. single photon interaction is a matter of some. Yes, yeah, yeah. Saying that he is considering unique photon, I can oh, think it is a thing or this will be a classical thing? No, no, the interaction is large. D ah. dot E. Yeah, large. Yeah, you, that is the he answer. Is in a classical yeah, way. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the basis is whether a field is treated in a quantum mechanical way or classical? Yeah, it's a classical way. Right. But we are quantizing the atom. So now, if you see the, uh, the medium response, which is governed by this uh, chi, so if you plot this chi as a function of delta, delta is the detuning of the field, where, where we define delta p is equal to omega p minus uh, 1, 3, then you can see that at delta p is equal to 0, you have a high absorption. So, if you want to make any observation at a different distance, you can see there is a no intensity. So therefore, its requirement is that you have to minimize the absorption. And that can be done with the help of the control field, which will couple to other state. Let me show you. So here, we bring one control field. And therefore, this control field will couple to other transition, one to two, and then what we are going to consider? The two state is empty and it is a metastable state. So three and two is, a, is going to be a metastable state. And therefore, what you are uh, doing, you can see the atom can reach to the excited state in the three, uh, two path. Can you figure it out? How many path? What are, what are the path you have here? One path is a direct transition in the presence of control, uh, probe and control field, 3 to 1, right? Another path? Another path would be 3 to 1, then 1 from 1, control field brings down here 2, and then also control field also takes it to the excited state. So we have a two path. One is the 3 to 1 direct path, another is the 3 to 1 to 2 to 1. And these two paths is going to do the interference. And if the phase is different between two paths by pi, then you are going to have a destructive interference. And what you have, you are going to get a transparency instead of that absorption. You can see this susceptibility behavior, what you have, like when the control field is not there, what it will be uh, behave? It will behave like a two-level system. But in presence of the control field, you can see that you are going to get a transparency window associated with the peak. And this, the nature of this denominator is going to, going to tell you what is the width of this transparency window and where is the location of the peak, right? So this denominator is very important because the complex root, the real part of the denominator is going to give you the, the location of the peak and the imaginary part of this uh, denominator is going to give you the width of the transparency window. So now, since we are going to talk about the vector beam and how the vector beam can be um, manipulated inside the uh, vapor and also the polarization of the Victor beam, how one can control with the help of the external control field. So we need to introduce the Stokes parameter because the polarization state can be defined by the Stokes parameter. Here we have introduced 
that uh, the two quantity, one is the ellipticity and uh, another is the orientation. And you can see that ellipticity can de uh, depend upon the real part of the electric field as well as the, uh, sorry, uh, right circularly polarized light field as well as the left circularly polarized light. And then the zeta can be defined as the tan inverse, the S2 and S1, these are the Stokes parameter. Now, if I calculate the rotation angle, that is the delta zeta, and it is the difference between the zeta at not equal to zero minus zeta zero, and you can see this structure. And this structure has a three dependent value. One is the difference of this orbital angular momentum, LR and LL, LL and LR. Since for the cylindrical vector beams, the LR modulus is equal to LL, so therefore this part would be zero. Only the non-zero part comes from the, the refractive index difference, that is the delta NRL, so that is the difference of the refractive index experienced by the right circularly polarized light minus the left circularly polarized light refractive index. So now you can see when it is free space, NR and NL both are same, right? So there is a no rotation in polarization. So now we require a medium where we have a correct refractive index difference. If NR is equal to NL, then what it will happen? The rotation due to the refractive index difference would be zero. So we have to have a opposite refractive index. So now we are going to work with the same three, I yeah. You are trying to say that using that beam for yeah. the yeah. you are trying to control your pi r and pi r. Yeah, yeah, that we are going to tell. That we are going to manipulate, right? So now, so we are going to do the manipulation. And here it is not a only one component. You have a two component. Earlier, you know, if you see the three level system, what do you have? The probe field, which is a scalar field, right? And it couples to one to three. And another is the control field, which couples to one to two, right? And the, the probe field, if you consider this is the sigma plus polarization, then the control field is the sigma minus polarization. It and control field here means the intensity is very high compared to the probe field. Probe field is very weak. And what you can do here, you know, uh, for this uh, density matrix, you can just expand the density matrix in terms of the weak probe field and just club the first order of the weak probe field and get this result, okay. Now, we are going to work with the vector beam. Means vector beam means you have a two component and these two component must interact with the medium, right? So here is the proposed system. So what do we have? This one, two and three. These three level are degenerated level in absence of the magnetic field. But when you apply the magnetic field, right, this will be non-degenerate, non-degenerate, one, zero and two, right? Now what we are going to do? This one and four and two and four, this will give you the electric dipole transition. And it will couple sigma plus or you can say right circularly polarized light as well as the left circularly polarized light, these two transition. Now the propagation of this beam along the z direction, if I couple zero, this zero to four, then the, the polarization of this coupling is pi. Therefore, this pi polarization cannot protect the vector beam component through the medium. Because why it is so? Because 
the component is moving along the z direction but the electric control field is moving the along the y direction so you have to be very careful about the coupling so that's why we consider the 3 to 4 and this is the atomic spectroscopic notation you will get this state in the real rubidium vapor so now once this control field is on then you, what you can imagine you can imagine it is a combination of two lambda system can you see one lambda system is 3 4 1 another lambda system is 3 4 and 2 which one this one is the microwave yeah yeah microwave so now you can see that you can trap you can initially consider the population in the one state and two state right and since the field is weak and this field is uh, strong you are going to get a the eit system because the strong field is acting on the non occupied state and this what it will do let me show you uh, both the light, uh, both the light. I will show you. So what it will happen? You have a four, and then you have a three, and you are switching on this omega c. What it will happen? It will mixture the four and three, and it will create a dust state. Right? Then what you can see, let us write this, this is one, right? For one component, then it is and you can see so transition can happen in your spectrum from 1 to minus 1 that is the day state. Day state means in presence of the control field this 4 and 3 is going to mix. So 1 can be written as a another So therefore, your right circularly polarized light has a equal detuning from the, the transition level, the day state plus and minus. So it will not see any absorption. Or you can think about the quantum interference way. So you can explain that thing. Yes, please. Yeah. 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 